I tend to be, had always been a little bit of a shy person or a little introverted, but in my magazine days, particularly running Cosmo and you know, whether it was being on the Today Show or giving speeches to a thousand people, I had to get over that, in, that shyness issue. And that translated now into feeling comfortable calling somebody up and saying, hey, would you be willing to help me out here? Because mm -hmm. I do do a lot of research on mm -hmm. my books. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks 2, where our guest today is Kate White, and we're going to be talking to her about her new book, The Fiancé, which is a book reporter bets on selection, and you're going to hear why, folks. Kate and I have known each other for a long time. We were on staff together years and years ago at Mademoiselle Magazine, and we're not going to mention how long ago that was, <laughs> like 20 minutes, maybe. She went on to many other roles in publishing, culminating with her being the editor-in-chief of Cosmopolitan. So there's lots to talk about here. So welcome, Kate. So great to see you. Oh, thank you, Carol. I wish I was there in person with you, but this will have to suffice. This will have to suffice. We'll just have to keep the, uh, the ambiance rolling, the same yeah. kind of thing we do in person. Yeah. So let's start with you telling us a little bit about The Fiance. Oh, I, I so enjoyed writing this book. It's a bit of a locked room mystery in that it takes place all in one location, this bucolic state. It's two parents who are in their 70s, their four adult sons, three wives, and one newcomer, this woman who will be announced as the fiance. And it isn't long before somebody ends up dead. And what makes it a little different than most locked room mysteries like and then there were none. Usually when someone ends up dead in a certain location and you realize the killer is among you, everybody's freaked. But in this case, the protagonist, Summer, is the only one who realizes the death probably wasn't natural. And so a big part of what she has to do is convince people, including her husband, that they, they have a reason to be afraid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a reason, folks, that stuff's <laughs> happening here. You just think it was coincidental that that happened. No, not quite that way. So what, do you just love reading Locked Mysteries? I mean, I love reading those books where it's in a location, the internet goes out, it, it like builds and builds and builds. Right. And then just, they're like, oh my gosh, I so don't want to be in that house anymore. And at the beginning I did, I thought it'd be great, but not now. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, you know, I loved And Then There Was None by Agatha Christie. And uh, Nio Marsh used to write a fair number of locked room mysteries. And so I always loved them. And years ago, I wrote kind of a half locked room mystery where the first half of the book was in location I always wanted to come back to doing a full on one, but I didn't know, you know how much that genre still re would resonate for people. But then all of a sudden, Ruth Ware started doing mm -hmm. them and Lucy Foley, and then there were Knives Out. And by then I'd already decided to do The Fiance and I felt at least the genre is appreciated again. Yeah. And this room, the locked room is this home that's gathering, they're where they're gathering on 60 acres in Bucks County. I like right. this. 60. I went back and read that and I was like, wait a second, 60 acres, quite nice. Giving them lots of room for the story to take place because then you're not just dealing with this house and the snowstorm and the power going out. Instead, these people are, it's summer. You should be able to get out and do things on all this land. You have a house in Bucks County. Was there some place out there that inspired this, some big estate, or is it just in your head? Well, I sort of took our property, which is an old farmhouse. We have a couple of outbuildings, a chicken coop that's a guest cottage now with no chickens in it, Carol. You, okay. you can sleep there when you come to visit, okay. and there will not be a chicken waking you up in the middle of the night. And I just sort of put it on steroids. I imagine our place blown out 60 acres and what would happen and uh the mother who's in her 70s of the of the mother of the four sons she's a landscape artist and a pretty prominent one she's retired now but she still does little jobs and i used a fairly famous person whose home was featured in the times with their landscape artists and I just thought I'm going to borrow this and 
put a lot of these things, including the the big boxwood trees shaped like as big snowballs. I, I put them all in my book and that was really fun to transport some of that stuff to this. And it's so it's it's my place on mega steroids. It's not just your dahlias in the backyard. It's many more flowers. Right? Yeah. <laughs> And they're all perfectly placed. I mean, I love looking at people's houses sometimes. Lisa Scott Elaine was showing pictures of her garden the other day. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like so well done. I mean, the colors go from one into the other. Like I try this, but I'm still working on it. This is, but when you see places like that, you know, somebody's a master gardener. You know, they know how to not make things die in the summer. Right, right. We have to have a little help from someone, but I've seen Lisa's pictures too. And it looks like uh, she's really figured it out for sure. Yeah, and she says she's not a gardener. I'm like, eh, I'm not so sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Liar. <laughs> liar, liar, liar. So people move around the grounds in the book. And so, yes, you, you're basing this a little bit on your property, on steroids and other things. Did you actually have a map of this is where the lake is? This is yeah. where like all these things are? Yeah, I have to do that. I'm a little bit OCD. And so I had to do that. And I generally, with every book, sketch out the houses. And I'm often inspired. I'll go through Architectural Digest or House Beautiful for something and use it as a starting point. But in this case, because the landscape was so important, there's mm -hmm. a stream, there are woods, there are dark woods, there are things that happen. There's a coyote apparently been prowling around and we have one of those too. We also have bears where we are. Mm -hmm. So I, I sketched it out. And that made it easier for me to kind of keep track when I was moving the characters around. Mm -hmm. And the coyote in the backyard, like walking, we, we have those two. <laughs> it's a, there, there was about a year ago, I looked outside and there was a bear like beyond like where our fence oh. was, our high fence was. And I just called my neighbor, I go, coming towards you. <laughs> so get over my fence. Oh my gosh, I know. I One of the things about the book, there's one character of the four sons or two are fraternal twins. And one of them, is a, kind of a a little bit of a nerdy nature guy and his twin brother who is much more charismatic and kind of the golden boy jokingly when he was younger called him scat man because he would go out and look around and see you know track animals i'm that person i borrowed that from me <laughs> and so one of the things i did enjoy during the pandemic is going around and looking at animal trackings. Mm -hmm. We've got a fox and the fox left some telltale signs. But I guess the, the worst thing is, is having this bear around. And, mm -hmm. and so when I go out in the evening to look at the fireflies, I always go, hello, hello, <laughs> anybody here? I don't have any honey. There's nobody here. <laughs> no honey, none <laughs> whatsoever. Yeah, I tell you, when I saw that, I was like, oh, this is the one everybody's talking about because now on Facebook, everyone shares, like, here's the bear, the bear is in my oh. house. I'm like, I guess the bear's coming up the block. Who knew? Just who knew? So the people are moving around on the ground. You've mapped out the locations. What drew you to have one of your characters be an actress, including, or an actor, including somebody who's doing voiceovers? What, where did that come from? Well, uh, this was my 15th suspense novel. And in the beginning, I borrowed a lot from my career in magazines, uh, you know, I, I had editors, I had in one, but my last novel, she was a financial writer, which was easy for me to do. I had somebody who did some marketing work, which was sort of an auxiliary to my magazine experience. And, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going down the list and I'm running out of stuff. And with this, I, I decided to use something that is close to home and that my husband, he was a former TV anchor man who after 9-11 decided I wanna make a change. And he had been an acting major in college as well as a broadcast journalism major. And he went back and to do theater in New York and nice. some TV and um, you know, a really fun web series. And my daughter went to the BU uh, acting conservatory, which you auditioned for. And then she went to the Met Film School in London for graduate studies. So I've been listening to their stories for years and seeing their plays. And so that's, I, I felt like I could write about it with a certain verisimilitude that would be okay. And then one of the people I got to know through my husband's 
to work uh, was a guy who's a director who's married to a, a pretty big time voiceover actress. So I basically said, Marsha, can I pick your brain? Tell me about it. And so I, I did a fair amount of research, but I also just, you know, pillow talk work too, since I'm, I'm married to someone who did a lot of acting. Don't go to sleep yet. I've got a question. Go <laughs> yeah. I got another question. Oh, yeah. Wake up. I've got another question. You know? Yeah. And <laughs> one of the things they shared so much about um, that I tried to incorporate in the book is that really great acting is you don't want to see them acting. It's all very natural and unstudied. And that's what all actors strive for is to have that. Yeah. And I think that you could see the, the stories of the auditions and the performances felt very real. It felt like, you know, the anxiety of, oh, I didn't get the job or I didn't get the gig. I didn't get what I wanted to do. Or I got this, but I'm with all these other people in the camaraderie that they feel in the, in the studio. And I think that yeah. anybody who's been involved with theater knows that camaraderie. Yeah. One of the things that being around people that my husband has worked with, you see how many talented people still don't make it. I remember one time we had this couple for dinner. She had been starred in Les Mis on Broadway and her husband played Javert in Les, um, in Les, Les Mis. And, oh no, she was in Phantom of the Opera and they were so talented, but there's, it's a really cluttered field and people mm -hmm. who are really, really good. Unlike in other fields, like I always say in, in magazines, the cream rose to the top, but not so in that field. And so you would find so many people who were so good and they didn't make it. And you saw the way it could eat at them. Mm -hmm. Though, of course, one of my favorite experiences, my husband was in this play and he said he'd love to have the cast over for dinner. And oh, it was so much fun. And there was this one young woman, he said, she's so talented. She's a comic too, Amy Schumer. <laughs> And wow, <laughs> we, we started going to see her in comedy clubs. And then she was in Last Comic Standing. She came in fourth place and I had her start writing for me at Cosmo. And then she blew up so big. And so once in a while, you get yeah. to see somebody it works out for. But the sad thing is for a lot of people in that field, it just doesn't. And it it is not a reflection of their ability. Mm -mm. It's not talent. It's timing. It's being in the right show. Oh, it's no. Something else. So you couldn't do this. I mean, we're seeing a lot of that going on right now, somewhat in the theater world, definitely in the television and film world, is um, if you were supposed to be making such and such a show, now everything is so backed up. Will you still be doing it? Will you oh, still yeah. be available? Because oh. you've got the, and everybody's dovetailing, everything's going on. And as Broadway is coming back now, you wonder who went on and did something else? Like maybe not the star of the show, but somebody who was something in the show that's and it's really, you know, people said, when is Broadway going to open? I said, after they practice, like Bruce Springsteen oh, practiced yeah. with himself. Bruce right. Springsteen was very easy to open, you know? Yeah. Yeah. A guitar, done. Right, right. I saw him, uh, outside, uh, uh, some video of him outside the the stage door. I, 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 just what you said, Carol, when you take everything that's they've got to deal with mm -hmm. and then add, oh, your field shut down for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. That's it's so, so sad. I feel so bad for so many of those people. And you think how many people left the city, left whatever, now it's come back, you know, start your life. It's like starting your life back up. I think the startup's going to be very interesting to watch. So here the <laughs> readers are told very close at the beginning of the book that Summer thinks it's Hannah, the fiance. She's she's now the girlfriend at the beginning. She be, she gets elevated like halfway through the book. You're like, <laughs> right, right. This is like really great. You know, what are you on your sixth date? And you're like immediately, and everybody thinks Nick is just like, you know, way out of you know control. And it's about them having met before. Summer knows she knows Hannah, but sets up a lot of doubt right from the start. Did you want eyes headed there first? Like, we've got a laser in on her. Yeah, I love the idea right away that Summer's got this thing about Hannah because she recognizes her, her recognizes her right from the get-go. Nick has brought this mystery date and no one's met her yet. And Summer realizes we were in an acting showcase together two years ago. Now, it was acting, I actually borrowed from a showcase my husband was in in, this, in the same little plays, 10-minute plays, and that's pretty common. 
But when Summer says to her, I think we've met before, and she's a little bummed that Hannah doesn't recognize her mm -hmm. because she realizes huh, this is um, perfect. You know, I mean, it meant a lot to her. And Hannah says, I don't think so. She goes, yeah, we were in this acting showcase down in the village. And Hannah says, I've never been in an acting showcase in the village. And so the first red flag that Summer gets is, Hannah just told me a big fat lie. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why, but she did. And so she has reasons in the beginning to not like Summer and yet everyone else is being charmed by her. So that becomes a really difficult thing for her. She wants to alert her husband, Gabe. She wants to alert others to the fact that she doesn't think Summer can be trusted. And yet they're all being charmed by Summer who seems to know how to charm everybody. Mm -hmm. And, and she's charming a mother. People. She's charming every single person. And it's like, oh, this woman is insufferable, but she's like basically able, and they're staying at the guest house. So she's like ranting and raging to her husband out there. And he's like, what? Like, you must have it wrong. Like, you've got to be wrong. You know, it's so right. Hard. And there's the other factor too is, Summer is more successful, is uh, Hannah's more successful than Summer is right now. Summer kind of started strong, but she's had a bit of a setback in her career, acting career, and voiceovers pay well, but they're not what she wants to be doing. And Hannah's doing a Netflix pilot. And one point, I, I have to be careful my language here, but uh, Summer says, is everyone on the freaking planet doing a Netflix? Netflix pilot, but me. Right. And so one of the things that's going on for Summer, and she has to figure out how to separate this, is she's envious of Hannah. Mm -hmm. Hannah's mm -hmm. got what she wants. Mm -hmm. And she was on a, sh a shoot or a voiceover the week before that did not go well. And she's waiting here. She's got that moment where the agent's going to just yell at her or she's not going to get another job. She's completely somebody who doesn't know where her life is going at this point. She's just right. completely upended at this point. And this other woman is so confident and is driving her crazy at the same time. Yeah, it's really, I think we've all been there moments where it's important in life to say, why should that piece of information make me feel any differently than I did 10 minutes ago? But all it takes sometimes is an editor calling you saying, wow, um, this isn't working for me or someone giving you a little dig or author tell me how they make the mistake of reading a really toxic review mm -hmm. one day right before they go to, to sleep and all that stuff can affect us in a way. And when you're in a world like Summer is acting, you're particularly vulnerable because you're you're relying on your performance for for feedback and had to help your ego feel okay mm -hmm. in fact she dashes out at one point and calls somebody she knows was at the show showcase so now we've got somebody <laughs> outside this like in a world because they do have cell phone service so she goes and calls him and she says look do I have this right? Wasn't this woman there? Wasn't she this? Can you look into this more for me? So she is so obsessed that, you know, she is the only person thinking this way. She goes to somebody outside and pulls him in. And I like that because it gave her this way of trying to make herself feel like you're not going crazy here. Right. And this guy who's a friend of hers from college, who I call them the actor barista tour guide friend because my husband actually had a guy who was in a play with who did all those things on the side and so he confirms her fears and says she might also be a thief but she she has a really hard time convincing her husband Gabe who can see that she's annoyed with Hannah's success Mm -hmm. So the whole cast of characters, the family, the, the brothers, sister, everybody, did you put that all together in advance? Like, did you have that, like, did it, some character appeal appear later? Or did you always know it's going to be this number of children, the housekeeper, like all these people? Or did you need people along the way to tell the story? I always do a lot of loose plotting in advance, Carol. I know who the killer is. I know who the players are. I I have a sense of how I might try to hide the killer. But one of the fun things about writing is that your characters develop 
mm-hmm. as you write and you discover certain things about them that you didn't know. And sometimes you go back and you feel, you know, particularly with of the four brothers, the two fraternal twins, I really felt as I got farther along, I, I need to go back and make them different enough because unlike identical twins that are very similar, fraternal twins are different. And so it's 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 a bit of both, but on, I know there are authors who say they they don't know where they're going. I know where I'm going. I once heard Laura Lipman say when I interviewed her for an event that she calls it like the distant shore approach where you know where you're headed, but a lot could happen as you're starting across the lake. Mm-hmm. I heard Megan Miranda interviewed by Mary Sue Rucci, her editor yesterday, and she was very funny because she doesn't know where she's going at the end. She said at some point, Mary Sue goes, you know where this is going to go, right? And she goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> she's like, Not really. Not really. She's, but she's like, this is, you do know there's going to end up someplace. And it was so much fun to hear that because everybody has a different process. Everybody has a different way that they work. Right. I have been on so many panels. I've interviewed a number of authors and everybody's different and there's variations in plotters versus pantsers i just don't think i could ever be a pantser i've I've read a couple books in the last few years by people who i know are pantsers and i feel that sometimes explains why the book just kind of unravels for me Mm -hmm. and i think that not everyone has that happen there are plenty Mm -hmm. of pantsers who do brilliant stuff but I feel that if I didn't know where I was going I could end up boxed into a corner Mm -hmm. and the the other thing and I've heard some other plotters say this too when you plot in advance and you know where you're going and you know who the killer is that allows you to do a better job of laying out the red herrings Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and because otherwise and I've heard pantsers say this you've got to go back and add the red herring scent because you didn't know who the killer was. And I like knowing where I'm going. But then of course, I'm a Virgo. (laughs) I don't know where I'm going. Well, you know what? So many times you're reading a book and sometimes I see that they're over-edited and you realize somebody says like, I did nine versions of this book. And I'm like, yeah, but we needed a 10th for somebody to come in from the outside and smooth everything over because that's so many passes going on it that the story's kind of lost. Like it's, it's not doing this anymore. It's doing something, you know? Yeah. And uh, one thing I'm struggling with as a reader uh, is the, the twists have to be so ratcheted up to date. I've read mm-hmm. a few that were just like that expression used in TV, it jumped the shark, you mm-hmm. know, when a series jumps the shark. And I felt, feel certain books jump the shark where you just think, wow. And that's like in Jaws where the, the, the Jaws, the, the shark kind of tries to take the helicopter down. <laughs> so one of the big challenges, particularly if you've written a, a bunch of suspense novels like me is, the, you know, trying to make it realistic so mm-hmm. the reader doesn't go, that would never happen. And mm-hmm. a lot of that is in the beginning, just really trying to think out your characters and their motivation. So it, it comes from someplace that's authentic seeming, I guess. So names also, do you go to the phone book, the obituaries, <laughs> or do you just draw them out of the air and do the, you have names written down that you'd like to use someday? Because Summer's a great name. It's a perfect name for her. Well, I've never admitted this to anyone, but with my main characters, I always love, I guess as a nature, not to use something that reflects nature. So I've had Robin, Phoebe, because there's a bird that's a Phoebe, Summer, and I, I always have that. In my next book, the character's name is Emma Hawk, but with an E at the end. And, and so that's the main character. Then I do a mix of it. I I once was at the Morgan Library and and Museum in New York, and there was a list of donors uh, at the front. And I thought, oh, those are some good names. And sometimes I've used the phone book. Uh, Lately, I love the book of Symmetry by Lisa Mm -hmm. Halliday. I named the character Halliday coming up, uh, last name Halliday. But what I do do that's very helpful is you can Google 
what were the most popular boys' names in 1979? So if you have a character who was born in 1979, you can figure out the most popular names because names, uh, particularly now, there's a lot of customization that's happening with names and certain names go out of favor and other names come back because mm -hmm. a celebrity might have named their kid that way but a lot of old-fashioned names like hazel are coming back so i i always start by googling what are some popular names of four people born in the year a character was born mm -hmm. there's a book out the britney's right now and all the girls are named britney in it and i'm <laughs> laughing because you know there were certain years and now there are a lot <laughs> right. of children that i joke will not have bicycle license plates because they're never like we had a friend two years ago named their child Caden and they said what do you think that means and I said no bicycle license plate I mean that's what I mean <laughs> right. well, right. so I think that the way we might make money right now is custom bicycle license plates for kids because yeah. we're coming from really you know? really who just thought who just thought <laughs> so Summer and Gabe are traveling with her stepson um Henry who's nine years old and did you like have a younger character to give the opportunity in plotting to have him see things that other people might not see like he's going to just come out with something or he's going to move the story in another direction just because he either has to go to bed or he wants somebody to play tennis with them or take him to the water whatever yeah i felt henry is a character that though there's nothing earth shattering he well I, there kind of is at the end there is something earth shattering mm -hmm. that he says but he's it, things spark off him mm -hmm. and, and he, he's a good kid. And I guess as a mom, I haven't written a lot about kids, uh, the main characters having kids that just, I guess maybe it's too close to home for me, but a stepson, I, in addition to having two kids, have a fabulous stepson who's now not a, a little kid anymore, but in some ways, I channeled him for Henry because he was just the easiest, nicest person and still is. And I feel so fortunate that I had a, a, a stepson like him. Like for Christmas this year, he gave me the Obama biography. <laughs> what, what, what's not to, to autobiography, a memoir? What's not to like about that? And so part of what Summer says about Henry is that she is a good stepmom, but he made it easier for her. Mm -hmm. So I channeled that. But I love, I like the idea of, of certain moments in the action have uh, kind of have a starting point with Henry, whether it's Henry wanting to do certain things that sort of bring Summer into a moment. But then there is something in the book that he shares uh, as a little kid that was meaningless to him that Summer realizes is very pivotal for what she needs to know mm -hmm. about what really is going on and why somebody died and how they died. And it's like out of the mouths of babes. It's like, <laughs> wait a second, what did he just say? Like, we're now listening to him. It was right. really good. The story moves so quickly. Do you work on pacing? Like this one was one, I kept going one more chapter, one more chapter, one more. It was a day read, I'll be perfectly honest. <laughs> I know it took you a lot longer to write it, but it was a yeah. day read for me. <laughs> I, I do try to work on pacing. And one of the interesting things is that it's changed so much from when I started in 2005 writing suspense novels. Even if you know Carol, if you read a Agatha Christie book, there's not a dead body sometimes halfway through. And now readers want action on that first page, the first chapter. They, they want it to move really quickly. So in the, the years I've been writing these 15 suspense novels, which is maybe like 18 years or so, I, I've really had to up my speed. And mm -hmm. so I'm conscious of that. And I'm conscious of is the chapter ending in a way that makes the reader turn the page. And I, when I go back and edit, and I do a lot of editing as I'm writing, I'm asking myself, is this moving fast enough? And you want every scene to have something fairly substantial or dramatic having, happening in it. Maybe it's a discovery. Maybe it's something the character realizes themselves, an insight. But you just never have characters meeting for coffee. 
Mm -mm, no. And I think that also the starts have to be quicker because people can read a chapter online before they choose to buy. And right. I think that that first chapter has got to be like this. And if it's not, it's not drawing somebody in quickly enough. Yeah, no, for sure. And that puts a little pressure on you as an author. But I also think there, if you look at books from the past, it's too bad because some of them wouldn't hold up today. Mm -hmm. I, agree. Uh, I mean, of course, we know some of the great books from the past started with that first sentence. Uh, last night I dreamed I was at Mandalay again, right? And so even some of those that might have started slow, they still hooked you with that first sentence or that first page. Mm -hmm. Now, how about the prologue? Did you go back and write that at the end? Because I've, I've been talking to authors a lot about prologues because I go back and read them at the end to see how it pulled the story together. Yeah, I, I, I'm not always, I don't always do a prologue. I know that some people say, hey, that's, that's, I wouldn't do a prologue. I think they're not the way to go. But I felt in this book, because I really wanted it to start with Summer and Gabe and the and Summer Stepson heading out to this bucolic estate and having the setting happen and setting it all up that way. If I started with something more ominous or sinister in, in that uh, kind of situation, it would spoil the um, opening of mm -hmm this estate experience for you. In fact, I just went to see the Frank Lloyd Wright house of falling water. And then I spent a night with my husband and two friends at another Frank Lloyd Wright house. And one of his theories was compress and release so that you went down a narrow passageway hallway and then you had this big great room. And so I, I really wanted that to unfold that way with the estate. So if I'm gonna do that, there's, there's nothing really sinister, scary, or ominous in that first chapter. So I felt I'm going to need a prologue to let the reader know that there's something really not good coming down the road. Mm -hmm. And it will be somewhat ambiguous because you won't know exactly what it's about. But that for me was a way to, to try to grab readers in the very beginning with other books I have started with a bang just with, with the opening of the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's, it, it depends on how the story is going to flow, but I agree. I'm open. this very sweet. We're going on vacation. And then it's like, wait a second, vacation is not going to go so well. You know that. <laughs> so, I also love this line. Um, Summer at one point thinks about a lesson she learned in acting class. The best acting is reacting, listening to the other actors and responding to them instead of constantly focusing on the line you're supposed to say next. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that authors do this with characters' voices, allowing them to lead them to places they may not readily go. Am I right? That is so smart. And I'm going to write that down and use it. <laughs> Carol, I don't think I ever really thought of it that way, but that's so true. What both Brad, my husband, my daughter, Haley said is what would they really drive into you when you do any kind of acting course? And they both studied it in college and in very intense programs. It, is that one of the mistakes people make, even when you're in a production that's fairly substantial, is that the actor is thinking about their next line. Mm -hmm. And what you want, and I'm sure Meryl Streep has never done this. Uh, she's been fabulous at it. But what you want is someone like her who's going to be listening to you. And then the line comes from her listening to you. And mm -hmm. she's not thinking of her next line. And I, that's something they've said over and over again to me. And I put that in the book. But I think what you said is just so right that sometimes, particularly as somebody who I plot loosely, but then I plot four chapters at a time, a little tighter in a notebook. Sometimes I know what people are going to say. And I think that what you said is such a great tool to sometimes step back and say, forget what you were just going to set, say in response to that character, but instead ask yourself, 
what did that character just say? What does that mean? Why did he say that? I, I think you just gave me a great little lesson there. It's a little gateway things. Because like, I'm just thinking about that because it's a way, if this character says this, then you have to react. If this does this, but sometimes they're going to say something and then it's going to shift the whole story. It's going to shift where you're headed. So right. And, and I, one of the things with dialogue, particularly where dialogue is fast, 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 it's, it's really great to be bouncing off that other character mm -hmm. and not get too caught up in what you wanted to say, because sometimes there is there's something there that really needs to be reacted to. There's one moment where that I love in the book where Gabe is complaining to Summer about her not liking Hannah and not handling it well. And and Hannah said, uh, Summer says, well, I can't fake it. He goes, I thought you were an actress. I <laughs> love that line. <laughs> That's a cheap shot, but it's, but it's perfect. It's to me, that is what you're talking about where she's responding exactly to what he's saying and not sort of just moving the ball down the field. Yeah, it's conversation, not dialogue. It becomes right. conversation, right. not the said, she said, that one did that, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's also a poem, Why I, Work, Why I Wake Early by Mary Oliver that works way into the plot. And I actually went up and looked up that there was really a poem because I confess poetry is not my thing. So why that poem? Let's start with why that poem. Well, uh, tragically, you can't write the whole poem, even though it's a short poem. It's it's very you can't get permission. So I just had to kind of hint at what the poem is about. But the uh, one of the main characters in the book is the mother, and she's a landscape art, art, art artist, and she loved loved you know Mary Oliver is somebody she really cares about. So. I wanted there to be something related to Mary Oliver and her liking Mary Oliver that is just a, a moment. And I, I actually am a big poetry fan, but it was more about, I felt that the character would really like Mary Oliver because Mary Oliver writes so brilliantly about nature. That's mm -hmm. all her poetry and she's deceased now, but all her poetry really has that running through it and it's just beautiful so i felt this is something that character would really love mm -hmm. this would be something that would be interest to her this is something she would have shared with others that meant something right. to her whatever right so what are some things from your magazine days that have helped you as a writer besides deadlines <laughs> <laughs> oh that's one of them for sure because you don't get writer's block Carol, as you know, when you're working in a magazine, you're not allowed it. You, you've got to get it out. And what you learn to do is just get something down mm -hmm. and then work on it over the next days, tweak it. And that was a big thing about magazines. I think also having a comfort level, interacting with people in order to feel then comfortable in this role calling up forensic experts and cops and lawyers and saying, would you be willing to give me 30 minutes of your time? And most of them are really great. And uh, I, I've met very few people, I can't even think of any off the top of my head who didn't want to share their time. Mm -hmm. So I think I tend to be, had always been a little bit of a shy person or a little introverted. But in my magazine days, particularly running Cosmo and, you know, whether it was being on the Today Show or giving speeches to a thousand people, I had to get over that, in, that shyness issue. And that translated now into feeling comfortable calling somebody up and saying, hey, would you be willing to help me out here? Because mm -hmm. I do do a lot of research on mm -hmm. my books. It's also understanding the editorial process. It's understanding that you're sending your book into an editor. They're going to do their part. You get your part back, but the process has got to keep moving. And you know that while you've never worked at a publisher, book publisher, you know all those steps to get it to the printer. Like, you know, all those steps of that, that change that's got to be made. It can't happen at the 11th hour. I've got to hit my marks along the way. They're and going to need time, you know? Right. And also that they are going to be open to you if you raise your voice about the cover and say, when we're getting ready to start thinking about the cover, I'd love you to try this or that. 
-hmm. The really amazing thing for me is as a magazine editor, I did a ton of research and I, I trusted my gut, but I also did a lot of looking at data. I, I had not only, I, I rated every single article, every single title, every single cover line. I did focus groups. I had a woman who was an expert on Gen Y, Gen X, who would just uh, be somebody I, I would do an hour consultation with every month. That was not something most magazine editors did, but I, I ran the most successful women's magazine in the world. And I felt I the stakes are too high not to do that. I can't mm -hmm. go just on gut. And the book business is not a big research business. And so I tried to bring some of what I know about the power of research into it where I'll, I'll look at trends that, that I see happening with certain books and covers, and maybe I'll do a memo that says, hey, I'm seeing this happening now. Can we consider that? And mm -hmm. that's been helpful. I, I wish yeah. the book industry did more mm -hmm. research, mm -hmm. but they, they don't. What's interesting, we're working with a client a couple of months ago who came from the business world and she's like, so we're going to run this ad. What are the metrics? What are we going to buy? <laughs> and she was talking about this ad campaign that the publisher was running and she had gone to them with all these questions and they were sort of like, blah, 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 blah. And she's like, well, the return of the ROI on this is going to be, blah. and she'd run a major company. And it was just very funny to hear somebody like, this is what's going to happen. And I'm like, mm, not quite like that. That's yeah, not, but that's don't you, you know, just from your magazine days, the same thing right and how do you bring that into what you do you must be doing that in a big way yeah well you are and you're also figuring right the pacing a lot of it remembers the pacing how you wanted people to open the book and keep on reading the magazine and how to right. pace it going through things like that yeah, yeah there's a lot of things that you're looking at you're also looking at there are people that you think are far more successful than they actually are when you look at numbers and so oh. it's very interesting to see that wait a second, so-and-so, like, and you would, you have much higher expectations of what is actually going on in this business. And I find that to be fascinating of while well, things can happen kind of with lights and mirrors of you, yeah. assume, you assume what's going on. One of the things I do with my agent is just look at sales mm -hmm. uh, because she has access to all that through what she subscribes to. And it really just for me to see trends, what's mm -hmm. selling, what's not selling and what's been amazing to see a number of authors who present themselves in a certain way and then they get things based on that maybe they teach these big programs and I think wow they are teaching these big classes and how to do this when their book sold 4,000 copies and mm -hmm. and there's no way for that that stuff doesn't get out there it's mm -hmm. not like with um, movies where you can go to box office mojo and see that, gee, um, that um, movie actually did really, really well. And uh, I, I didn't know it was gonna do so well, but that's telling me something, Knives Out, for instance. Mm -hmm. you can look up and see what that did worldwide. Well, you can't do that with books. And it is shocking sometimes to see uh, who is out there presenting themselves uh, in a certain way. And I think it's good that we, we all need our mojo and be able mm -hmm. to do that. But I, but I think when they're teaching courses and teaching other people how to write, that yeah. it would be helpful if people knew, gee, maybe they don't know as much as Lee Child might know about <laughs> teaching somebody that. I'm also interested to see how people sell around the world. I always find that's interesting too. There are people that are bigger in the UK. They say, I'm going to go to Germany. I'm a rock star. I'm yeah, gonna go to yeah. I'm big. And I find that, and you know, with movies, you also used to want to watch the box office worldwide, like what Asia was looking for and what, you know, what, what was happening. And I think that in this last year, there's been such a stop on all of this and starting it up is very, very slow. I mean, even looking at the movie theaters, I mean, I think um, F9 was the movie last week that they were thinking was going to save theaters, like you know, box office office theater and stuff like that. Very interesting to see where are we going from here because we started at nowhere and we've got to go back up. What's going to happen? Right, right. It is also interesting. And I think coming out of the pandemic, I, when I went to the hairdresser the other day, I asked her, what are you seeing that um, people are asking you when they come in? Are they saying, 
oh, I'm so used to just really casual. I want to keep it casual. And she goes, no, they want to be pretty again. Everyone's mm -hmm. saying, I just want to look really good again. We aren't going to know how this is all going to play out. Mm -hmm. There might be a type of movie, a type of book that we want, a type of food, type of clothes we want to wear. That's going to be different than right now. People saying, well, we're all used to only wearing pretty tops and wearing our, our sweats on the bottom. And, and we're going to want to continue with that. Not necessarily. Mm -mm. I do think that the four inch heel may be on the way out. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. And, and a lot of the stuff going to the office closed, you are going to need a lot less of them. You're not going to need quite as many as you needed before. Right. But a, a lot of my friends um, went gray, something that will not happen to me. I'm Italian. We stay brown forever. <laughs> so oh, it was really so interesting. It was very, very interesting to see how many of my friends went gray. I was like, and I was like surprised. I thought that, but they use this as an opportunity to just grow their hair out because they said they weren't going to be seeing anybody and they didn't want to have to go to the salon as much. And I asked the people at the salon, what do they see as change? And they said, a lot of people stayed gray. And yeah, I thought- that I have a couple of friends who did that. One of my best friends, she looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. but I think it was a way to test it. She couldn't. Uh, uh, she's one of my best friends from Uruguay where we live in the winter, but we couldn't be there this past year, but there was no way for her to get her hair colored. And she, so she went gray. And she likes it. She's going to stay with it. And it's much, much less of a hassle. Mm -hmm. So I think a, a lot of us tried things on for size this year. And we're going to then evaluate whether it's something that maybe we'll want to stick with. I actually just did a blog that that it was something that I that I was reflecting on that I'm trying to use now. Years ago, I interviewed a woman who was a, a, a police officer who dealt with crisis situations. And one of the things she said to me was that you often have more time than you realize, not a lot of time, but if, if you've been called in to deal with a, 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 a potential jumper on a ledge, you might have 10 more seconds than you realize to think out your strategy. And that that's going to be good for you. And you should take that 10 seconds. And I've been trying, I don't know how you feel about this, Carol, but just trying to step back as I'm coming out of this and not just sort of race into it. Mm -hmm. Like right now, New York is like an overturned beehive and just step back and say, what did I learn during this period? Mm -hmm. What do I want to get rid of? What do I want to keep? Are there any lessons here? I mean, do you feel the same way? Completely, completely. Um, it was even just today. Like usually, I, okay, we're working home. I usually work straight through the day, like straight through the day. In fact, I had lunch with my husband and son at the kitchen table a couple weeks ago. I go, this is really nice. Now I could do that every day, but because of the pace I was used to working at in New York, you never stopped. You just either went out to lunch or you ate at your desk. You went out to lunch with clients or authors or you sat at your desk. That was basically the way your day went. So Today, I realized there were some plants I want to take from the living room and bring them outside. And I realized I'm starting to hit this thing in my head that I'm allowed to do that in the middle of the day. <laughs> I'm allowed to leave my desk. Yes, and Carol. It was for years. It was like, maybe I want to make part of a recipe in the middle of the day, but oh no, I'm working. All of a sudden, <laughs> I really took me a year of working home to sit there in more than like 15 months and say, you know, you're allowed to do something else. It, like there is lunchtime. There's <laughs> not from the minute you wake up and start looking at your phone at seven o'clock till you, you know, stop doing that. And I see that and I, I was out with a cousin a couple of weeks ago and she said, I don't think I'm going to return to everything I did before. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to carefully evaluate what are the things I want to keep and what are the things I don't? And yeah. she said, it may be a class I was going to. It may be just all these things I was doing. And which do I want to keep? And which do I want to get rid of? And I think that the one thing that I've seen happen in the last year is more people are reading. I've heard more people talking. And I've heard reading is up. And you know, part of it was I was talking to somebody last spring. And I said, look, there's not going to be any TV sports. I mean, we're going to have to come up with something. They can't <laughs> make shows. They can't do theater. We can still do what we're doing. And I think that... That's the reason we saw this surge in reading and what's going on. I think people are realizing they like it. They like being right. able to do this that they didn't have time for before. I mean, a lot of people are commuting and running all day long. Maybe I, one, you know? One thing for me, I'm, I'm sort of 
going to be sick of doing Zoom calls with friends, but I did do some online stuff I liked. I did a, uh, my college offered you the opportunity to do a six weeks, 26 weeks course on the Holocaust, which I so uh, love doing. I'm doing a Yale course now on the Civil War. It, it's, you don't have to do anything for it. You just listen to the classes. And I, I did do a, a bunch of master class stuff on on uh, uh, Thomas Keller, Alice Waters, uh, some of the great chefs mm -hmm. that that were just really interesting to see them talk about their recipes and stuff. So I'll probably do a little bit more online learning. Mm -hmm. I, I've enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed interviewing authors like this, and I've gotten to interview people from Australia, New Zealand, around the world, people on their time zones, figuring it out that may not have come to the States. We used to do these interviews in our office, but I've often said the author was not often in New York for their tour. Right. They were there for their marketing meeting when I hadn't read the book and there was no cover and there was you know nothing like that was going on. So for me, it's an opportunity to either on pub day around there or even further out you don't have to do everything the week the book comes out. You can move things in different directions. Right. And, and we can move a book back if we've done, if they have a hardcover, it's moved into paperback or there's a theme in it. You can rerun that and it's still a story. And we couldn't do that before. It was live, you know? Right. And also what's great for me too is some of the people that I interact with, like my yoga teacher and you know, she does, I do a training thing with her once a week too, that's more aerobic, people like that, that it was always so time consuming mm -hmm. to kind of, if you were going someplace, to just be able to do it by Zoom now and mm -hmm. not, and, and my physiatrist, which is a doctor that helps you deal with any kind of uh, joint or bone issues, she does it online and she can ex basically examine you online. And boy, it saves you a trip for me across town. It's mm -hmm. just fabulous. So I'll probably do more of that. But even think of when you're in Uruguay for the winters, what you will be able to do now, participate in that you'd say, oh, I love to be at that event. Now you can go right, and see that right, event. Right. And you can connect with people there when you're here. I don't know, there's this four letter word Zoom has taken us in so many different directions. If we didn't have this and we didn't have social media last year it would have been a lot harder. I mean, it would have been a lot more. How would we have done it? My husband and I talk about what a nightmare it would have been. And uh, I just feel so, it's really been great as we're coming out of it. You feel so bad for countries like Australia, mm -hmm. which now they had a plan, but they didn't factor in vaccinations. And now with the variants, it's just going to be a nightmare there. Mm -hmm. But we, we are just walking around New York today and seeing how vibrant the city is and sort of mm -hmm. feeling well, there, there's we're on the other side of this for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're definitely moving to a new direction. So let's look at this cover. So what was your input on this cover? Because it's such a cool cover. I'm going to do this. It's, it's, it's been interesting because so many women on Instagram did that same thing. What I said to them is, I love it when the cover, in, in a way, tells a story in a, in a second. Mm -hmm. so that it isn't just an image of a flower, let's, let's, say, let's say, or if you look at my fabulous uh, former uh, employee, Jessica Knoll, who wrote Luckiest Girl Live. I just love being kind of a mentor to her. She's so amazing. And when you look at Luckiest Girl Live, it's a flower, but it's a, I think it's a black rose. Right then, you know, something bad happened with something traditional. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted there to be mm -hmm. something that right away, the, the person who's picking it up uh, at a bookstore on the table or sees it online could almost imagine what the story could be, I told them. And I think the art director did such a good job of, you see right away that there's a woman, she's pretty seductive seeming with the red lips uh, and there's something mysterious, the way she pulls the curtain. And so, you know, there's a fiance, but there's something about her I'm not going to like. Mm -hmm. And in a, in, a, in a sense, 
you've got this the book in a in a micro moment, mm-hmm. and that I think to to me really works. And I love books that have that aspect to them too. Where like I dot of blood over the e, like there's a dot of blood. It's like yeah, a, oh yeah, I love that. There we go. There we go. And it's sort of like from the days of doing cover lines that you've got to draw somebody in. You've got and you know that from those days of it was not just the model and their eyes or whatever. It's those lines that are going to draw people in, and even the shape of the type, where the type is, where mm-hmm. this line is above. All those things absolutely matter on making a cover. It yeah. it's so true, and you only have a few seconds to grab someone and sometimes one of the mistakes I used to see people doing with covers and magazine covers and sometimes it's even with book covers if you have too much going on mm-hmm. the consumer doesn't know where to focus and you've sort of lost them in that because right the our attention span now is just so so short mm-hmm. really it's like you know we're in and out and if you're just reading a story and it's not there you're like oh where's the picture where's the this okay, okay if not I'm out I'm out I mean, you're not getting to your point quick enough you know I first started out being a long fan of your Bailey Wiggins series and Bailey Wiggins is somebody I haven't seen in a while you've written a bunch of standalones which gave you the opportunity of writing you know when, when you're writing her you're given a place without being tied now to her character's backstory. I mean, with her, you always had to remember she did this, she did this, she did this. So she can't have done this, 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 because they know what she's already done or they're going to figure it out if they read all the books. Has that been freeing for you in writing the standalones? Yes and no, because I, 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 I do love each book coming in with a new character and feeling this is exciting. She's, I think she's going to do this. I just handed a book in, but I'm starting another one for 2023. And I came up with a job for this person, a a career that I just love. It was really interesting and starting the research on it. But I loved Bailey and the arc of her life. And Mm -hmm. what right now, I, you know, a lot of readers will write in and say, what, where's Bailey? And it's just that the standalones now do better than Mm -hmm. the the series because again, I think it is because of attention span. Mm -hmm. Even if you would tell a reader, you don't need to read the first seven books. They think they do. They, they, they think they are going to miss something if they just come in cold. And it's, it's just unfortunate right now. I think most readers want the standalones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like we're in and out with this and this is what we're going to do. And that may change too with time for sure. When I was thinking at the moments that when you're stuck on character development, oh, if I only had Bailey's backstory right this moment, it'd be, <laughs> easy, it'd be such an easy moment, you know? Um, was this always the title? Did you know going in that it was the fiance or did you play around with others? I had another one that I liked too, but there was something similar. And I, I think the only thing my editor and I talked about is is the accent with the fiance going to be a problem? And maybe that's why no one's ever used the word fiance because you always have to press down with your computer uh, to the E to get it. But we never, until the art director put that little dab of blood uh, uh, instead of an accent, we didn't realize that the accent wasn't a negative. In this case, it's a positive. And I haven't seen it be a negative in any way. No, I don't think it is either. I don't think that it's, you know, this is what's going to do. So Cindy K narrates the audio book. Do you select the narrator for your audio books? Do they send you choices? It's funny. I I'm so weird about books. I do not really listen to the whole book mm-hmm. on audio. And years ago, I was when I was at Cosmo, I gave a dinner for Katie Heigl. Uh, because we're going to do a cover on her. And it was a lot of the cast from Grey's Anatomy. And I was sitting next to the beautiful Kate Walsh. And we were chatting a little bit. And she said, uh, gosh, you know, you're the editor. And she was asking a little bit about it. I said, I also write uh, murder mysteries. She goes, oh, really? She said, I just did the audio last year for a murder mystery. And I said, oh, what was she? all oh, about this girl, Bailey Wagons. And I said, oh. I wrote that and she looked at me like, like you didn't know I did the audio, but I didn't because I, I, I just am too squeamish listening. Right. But 
as audio has become so important and I sell a fair amount of audio mm -hmm. that I, I started not only hearing them, but rejecting people and then also asking them to do samples from the book. Mm -hmm. And I've been much more assertive because you, I think when you know that a certain percentage of readers are reading it that way, reading it that way, you want to be involved and you mm -hmm. can't just say, okay, uh, what would you, happen in the past? They send you three people and you'd listen to them just read from another book. Mm -hmm. And now I make them read from my book and I might even go back and, and give notes, which mm -hmm. is obnoxious, but no, but you know what? It is true because like somebody said, well, what are, like, what are sales? Well, now you've got to do on a weekly basis, you've got to do print E and audio. And that's right. your number. Your number right. is no longer that print number anymore. And right. the audio rights used to be like your rights to Finland. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's like Very like, you know, okay, maybe Finland's not that small, but very tiny countries, you know, it, it was like, that's what it was like. But now audio is such a much bigger part of the marketplace right. that you really have to pay attention to it as part of your whole, this is what's going on. I mean, there's certain people that they've narrated all their books, even though they're standalones, just because they like the way they narrate their work. There's some people that have a different UK um, audiobook narrator than in the US. There are all these things that you've learned. I um, interviewed an, uh, three audiobook narrators, um, a couple of performers a couple of weeks ago. And it was so interesting to hear how they get the jobs, what's going on, a multicast recording, how they get paid based on that. Audiobook um, narrators, I learned, are based on the word count in the book. That's how the, the, the rates are, are, and I didn't know that before. Yeah, uh, it's interesting because my husband just, one of the things he started doing as, as an actor during the pandemic, he started doing audio for books. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that the, the voiceover actors I interviewed for the fiance told me is that even though th there's a prestige to doing audio for books, it doesn't pay very well compared to most voiceover work, which is can be quite lucrative because you are, you don't get paid for all the prep work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you have to reread the book, get a sense of who the characters are, how, how, how are you going to change it up? And so you've done all this prep work, but you're only getting paid from when you start recording. Mm -hmm. And so, but I wanted Summer, my character to want to do it because it's acting at least, unlike mm -hmm. doing, um, listen carefully because our menu options have changed. <laughs> we have to have a little bit more of what's going on for her, you know? Right, like, right. No, but it, it is, and I, a lot of authors say they can't do their own because they'd be making edits all along the way. And they said, no, you have to read what's on the page. You right. can't make up new words. These are the uh, words. You know? Yeah, and I did with the gutsy girl handbook because I've, I've written a couple nonfiction books and a, a few years ago I updated why good girls don't get ahead which had been a bestseller a number quite a few years ago I did this shortened version the gutsy girl handbook and it's all first person so I said well I don't know if I want somebody else saying I did this and I did that and they said you can do the audio <clears throat> and it was really hard mm -hmm. and voice by the end was was really in bad shape and I had this fabulous director who also does audiobooks herself and she told me this little trick you you put cinnamon in tea and that helps your voice and it really did work but you don't want to just have a teaspoon of cinnamon no 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 that's not good but cinnamon. very very interesting yeah, yeah but it, it is all those experiences but having done that you understand it more. Having done that, you now understand this is like, you know, what's the, what's next. So what is next for you? So you've already turned in what this is, this is really big. You've already turned in next year's book and you're working on the following. Okay, overachiever or what? <laughs> well, it's that book a year contract that so many thriller authors have to have that, that your readers want to know that, you know, if you're someone like, like a Lee child, though, I guess he's retired now. If they want to know, I've got, I'm going to be able to get my Jack Reacher book this year. Mm -hmm. And if you're just 
again, because of the attention span issue, if you're not out one year, it's easy to sort of really seem absent and mm -hmm. people forget. So they want you to do a book a year. And what I have to do is all, always while I hand my book into the editor and I handed it in maybe six weeks ago and she's going to read it and she just got back to me with notes. I have to come up with the next idea by then mm -hmm. because while I'm doing anything she wants me to do, the other idea is marinating. So I've actually written a couple chapters of the 2023 book, but I probably won't start that to the fall, but it's somehow in my brain the characters are cooking up a few things and coming up with some naughty ideas while I'm working on <laughs> some books from my editor. So here's a question. Did you ever feel like, I don't know if I've got another story in me. Has that happened to you? I'm not sure I can do the next one. Or are you good at that? Probably because you did 12 magazines a year, you know, you can do another one. <laughs> well, what you do discover as a writer is that e your brain does this really magical thing of thinking for you, even when you're not consciously doing it. And you just have to relax and allow that to happen. And one thing that really helped me years ago when I was in the magazine business, I was at a retreat that my the president of the magazine division did for uh she called mind, body, and soul. And it was for women advertisers and some of the women editors in chief. And there was a woman I happened to be sitting next to named Laura Day, who was wrote a book called Practical Intuition. And I ended up interviewing her just for a short little item in the magazine. And one of the things she said is when you are in doubt of anything cr creative, you put the question out to the universe. And I heard somebody else say this too uh, once who was uh, in the creative field. It's not like some mystical thing, but it's the idea that if you prime your brain, you prime your subconscious to be open, then you're walking along the street and you see a, like even today when I was walking to lunch, I saw this one black wool glove lying on the sidewalk. <laughs> it's 98 degrees. <laughs> and you could use that if, if I've been thinking, what should my next book be about? And I see this black wool glove, maybe I can start playing with it. What's that doing there? What if the person, whatever. And so what I do, and it is tricky when you've already written 15, like, am I going to get another one? I just try to relax and put the question out there with the idea that I'm not going to get some mystical answer like, okay, this is your next idea. Okay. Thank you, you for asking us. <laughs> yes. But it's that your subconscious is now waiting to for input. And when you see the black love or you see a woman running down the street or you see a newspaper headline about a building collapse and not everyone's accounted for. And you wonder what if this was the opportunity for one person to escape their lives? All that stuff then plays into your brain. And then magically something hopefully always comes out. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, when I saw the building collapse in Florida the other day, we were driving in the car and I said to my husband, okay, now what if there was an incendiary device at the bottom? And it was because somebody didn't like somebody and da, 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 da. And there's this whole reason that this whole thing happened. I'm going on. I said, I could just call somebody and they could just write this because I think I've got it. And it's that thing Nelson DeMille tells me that people show up to him and they go, I've got an idea for a story. And he goes, great, write 10,000 words and come back to me. <laughs> I'll tell me how that went. Exactly. Said, this is my yeah. Nelson DeMille moment in the car. But I said, doesn't this sound like a really good story? Doesn't this sound like, and he started laughing. And he's like, yes, that sounds very good. You know? Well, you just brought up the tool that so many authors use. What if you just mm -hmm. start with the germ, whether it's a headline or once I just started with the word twins and you start playing with it. And I, I keep a digital fi a file, a digital file of uh, links to crime stories that I've read. And sometimes I just go through it and you see a word again and you go, what if, what if? And fortunately, 15 books in, it's still working. But there is that fear of, okay, what about book 18? Is that going to work as well? 
can set it in Uruguay. We can set it someplace else. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. go back to Uruguay. Then we can figure yeah. it out. Yeah, exactly. What is the theme of next year's book? Just a little teaser on it. What is it? Oh, I love this one. It's about a woman who first husband was murdered now she's remarried and she begins to worry that the first husband might possibly have had something to do the second husband with the first husband's death ooh, ooh. even though she didn't know him then so i i think it's a, a good premise and i really liked writing it Look forward to reading that one next year. Put me on that early copy list. <laughs> Thanks, Carol. I've already been. It was fun though because I read this a while ago, but I remembered it today, and I thought that was pretty good. Like oh, I was making notes. I, was that's like, that's I don't good remember time. this book, you know. Kate, as always, it's been so great to talk Carol, to you. Carol, gosh, can I just say, first of all, you are just mo one of my my favorite people in the world. I love that we go back to the magazine business, and thanks for all you do for authors and readers. We we cherish you. <laughs> and you have a fabulous Instagram account with great photography. So you've got a lot of other skills too. Well, I sit there, I'm like, like we like to cook, we like to garden and there's on that page. That's what we do. <laughs> you know? Everybody goes, can I come over for dinner? I go, anytime, we love company. We love yeah, company. I love what you told me when I looked at all your meals, you said, I cooked dinner uh, for my family during COVID. But lunch, they had to figure that out themselves. They were all, and you were doing lunch too. I was like, whoa, you're oh, much better than I, I am. You were my inspiration. I stopped the minute you told me that. <laughs> no more lunch. It's got Lunch has got to be leftovers. You're on your own, one or the other. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Girl, great. Thanks so, Thanks much, so much. Love you, babe. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks To.